I would like to welcome everybody to the Hebraic Heritage Ministries Yeshiva Discipleship Program. We are currently doing a study series on the biblical festivals. In this week's session, we are going to be doing a study on the festival of first fruits. In Leviticus chapter 23, verses 10 and 11, it is written, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you come into the land which I have given unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Therefore it says here that the festival of first fruits is the day after the Sabbath during unleavened bread. In Leviticus chapter 23 verse 10 says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf. This is the Strong's number 6016, and it's the Hebrew word omer. It says that you shall bring a sheaf, an omer, of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. What is an omer? In Exodus chapter 16, verse 36, it says, Now an omer is the tenth part of an ephah. The rabbis, interpreting Exodus chapter 16, verse 36, that an omer is a tenth of an ephah, interpreted the word omer to be a measure of grain and also ruled that it was to be brought of barley only, This is found in the Talmud in Menachot 68b. Now let's look at the ceremony of bringing the first fruits of barley, which is in the Mishnah of the Talmud in Menachot chapter 10, sections 1 through 5. If the barley was ripe, it was taken from the vicinity of Jerusalem. Otherwise, it could be brought from anywhere in Israel. It was reaped by three men, each with his own skiff and basket. The grain was then brought to the temple, where it was threshed, parched, spread on the courtyard floor to be dried by the wind, milled, and ground into fine flour. It was then sifted through thirteen sieves, And one-tenth was given to the priest, who mixed it with oil and frankincense for a pleasing odor to the Lord, and waved it before the Lord. This was done by the priest taking the offering on his outstretched hands and moving it from side to side and up and down. After the waving ceremony, a handful was burnt on the altar, and the rest was eaten by the priest. The first fruit offering was given for inheriting the land of Israel. This can be seen in Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verses 1 and 2 it is written, And it shall be when you are come in unto the land which the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance, and possess it, and dwell therein, that you shall take of the first of all the fruit of the earth, which you shall bring of your land that the Lord your God gives you, and shall put it in a basket, and shall go unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose to place his name there. Of course, that is Jerusalem. The first fruits offering was given from seven different kinds of food, as ruled by the rabbis in Mishnah Bikarim 1.3 that the seven different kinds of food that are associated with the land of Israel, which is enumerated in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, should be given as first fruits, or the Hebrew word is bikarim, a first fruit offering after inheriting the land of Israel. And looking at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, it is here where we find the seven kinds of food that are associated with the land of Israel, as it is written. 
For the Lord your God brings you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. The first fruits offering in inheriting the land and dwelling therein is an offering where it's commanded in the Torah that a declaration of thanks be given when the offering is presented to the priest. This is found in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 3, and then verses 5 and 6. As it is written, And you shall go unto the priest that shall be in those days, and say unto him, I profess this day unto the Lord your God, that I have come unto the country which the Lord sware unto our fathers for to give us. And you shall speak and say before the Lord your God, A Syrian ready to perish was my father. And he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few, and became there a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us, and laid upon us hard bondage. We looked at the Passover Seder a few lessons back, and this here in Deuteronomy chapter 26 is included in the Passover Seder. Continuing on regarding the declaration, in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 7 through 9, And when we cried unto the Lord God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. And he has brought us into this place and has given us this land, even a land that flows with milk and honey. It now says in Deuteronomy chapter 26 verse 9 that he brought me into the land. So because Yahweh brought me into the promised land, that is why I'm to bring first fruits to him and rejoice in doing so. Deuteronomy chapter 26 verses 9 through 11. And he has brought us into this place and has given us this land, even a land that flows with milk and honey. And now, behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land, which you, O Lord, have given me, and you shall set it before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. And you shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord your God has given unto you and unto your house, you and the Levite and the stranger that is among you. The first fruit offering could be brought to the temple from Shavuot, or the Feast of Pentecost, to Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. This ruling is mentioned by the rabbis in the Mishnah in Bikarim, chapter 1, sections 3 and 6. The first fruits offering and the declaration of thanks could be brought from Shavuot, or the Feast of Pentecost, to Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. This was the common practice in the first century to present it during that period of time. And normally it was brought at the Feast of Pentecost or Shavuot, which was the earliest possible time. First fruits or Bikarim are associated with the first. First in Hebrew is Reshit. In Leviticus chapter 23 verse 10 it says speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them when you come into the land which I give unto you and shall reap the harvest thereof then ye shall bring a sheaf that's an omer of the first fruits the word first fruits is not bikarim but it's reshit which means the first you shall bring an omer of the first of your harvest unto the priest so reshit means the first the beginning the best, the choicest. The first, or reshit, offerings is to be given to the Levites. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 1 and verse 4, it is written, The priests, the Levites, and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his inheritance. 
the first fruit, and here it's the Hebrew word reshit, also of your corn and of your wine and of your oil, and the first, once again it's reshit, of the fleece of your sheep shall you give him. The first or reshit is to be given to the God of Israel. In Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9 it says, Honor the Lord with your substance, with the first fruits, it's the Hebrew word reshit. Honor him with the beginning, the first of all of your increase. Now let's look at the purpose of creation and see how creation is connected with reshit or the first, or the beginning of things. If we look at the very first word in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1-1, it is the Hebrew word breshit. And if you look at the first letter of the first word of the Bible, breshit, there is something unique about that first letter when you look at it in the Hebrew text. What is unique about it is the letter is enlarged. The letter itself is a bet. Bet in Hebrew means a house. So right away attention is drawn because of the enlarged letter as to why is this letter enlarged and the letter itself means a house. If we put together the first and the second letters of Breshit, it forms the word bar. Bar in Hebrew means sun. Therefore, the first letter, Beit, means house. The first two letters spell sun. Now, if we take the first two letters of Breshit, the Bet and the Resh, which spells bar, and then we look at the last two letters, which is the Yod and the Tav, and put that together, it forms a word Brit. Brit in Hebrew means covenant. If we put this together, the God of Israel created the heavens and the earth because he desired to have a house, bait, for his son, Bar, and this was going to be accomplished by means of a Brit or a covenant. For the sake of those who are classified as Reshit or first, the beginning. If we separate the first letter of Breshit, which is the Bet, what is left is the word Reshit, which means the beginning or the first. Putting these thoughts together, the God of Israel desired to build a house, that is Bet, for his son by means of a covenant and separating the Bet from Reshit reads in Hebrew, for the sake of the beginning. He's doing this for the sake of the beginning. This is pointed out for us by Rashi to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis Midrash Rabbah chapter 1 in section 4. The Torah is referred to as being wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13, and in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 18, it is written, My son, if you will receive my words and hide my commandments with you, so the subject is my words, my commandments, so that you incline your ear unto wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. It goes on in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1, and it says, My son, forget not my Torah, but let your heart keep my commandments. So the subject is my words, my commandments, my Torah, and incline your ear to wisdom. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13. Happy is the man that finds wisdom and the man that gets understanding. So the Torah and the commandments are called wisdom and they're called understanding. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 18. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retains her. Why do we make mention that Torah is called wisdom? It's because in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 19, it tells us that wisdom created the world. 
The Lord by wisdom has founded the earth, by understanding has he established the heavens. If the Torah is called wisdom and he founded the earth by wisdom, therefore he created the heavens and the earth by his Torah or with his Torah. Actually, the rabbis teach that he looked into the Torah and created the world. If the Torah was created by wisdom, who is referred to as being wisdom? It is Yeshua. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 24 and then in Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 and 16 but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks Messiah the power of God and the wisdom of God he's called the wisdom the world was created by wisdom or by Yeshua how did he do it by speaking the world into existence it was willed by the father but Yeshua spoke what the father willed Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 and 16 who is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created by him and for him it tells us in Psalm 33 verse 6 and verse 9 that the word of the God of Israel created the world. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. It was done by the word of the Lord. Who is the word of the Lord? That is Yeshua. So we are told that Torah or wisdom created the world. Yeshua is the living Torah. Yeshua is wisdom. Therefore, Yeshua, by his spoken word, created the world. Now we are told in Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 and 23, that the Torah existed before the creation of the world. How is this so? Well, it is written in Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 and 23. The Lord possessed me, and it's speaking about wisdom, which the Torah is called wisdom. So the Lord possessed wisdom, or the Lord possessed the Torah, in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. The works of old is referring to the creation of the heavens and the earth. I was set up from everlasting. The Torah was set up from everlasting. Wisdom was set up from everlasting. From the beginning or ever the earth was. Once again, making reference to the creation of the heavens and the earth. And here, wisdom is speaking and wisdom is being personified as being the Torah. So the Torah is called the beginning. The God of Israel wanted to create a house for his son by means of a covenant for the sake of the beginning. And who or what is called the beginning? The Torah is called the beginning. So he did this all for the sake of his Torah. And his Torah being lived in the earth. But not only is the Torah called the beginning, but Israel is called the beginning or the Reshit. In Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 3, Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits. This is the word Reshit of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, says the Lord. Once again, the Torah is called the Reshit or the beginning in Proverbs chapter 8 verse 22. The Lord possessed me, referring to wisdom, in the beginning, Reshit. So wisdom or the Torah is called the beginning. Israel is called the beginning. And Yeshua is called the beginning. Based upon this understanding of Genesis 1-1 and specifically the word Breshit, this is how John begins his gospel account in John 1-1. In the beginning, which is Breshit, or it can be rendered Reshit. Reshit, beginning, was the word. Yeshua is Reshit. He's the beginning. Beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. The same, that is Reshit, was in the beginning, with God. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23, it says, But every man in his own order, Messiah, the first fruits, afterward they that are Messiah's, 
at his coming. Therefore, the world was created for the sake of the beginning, separating the bet from Reshit in Breshit in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. And once again, Rashi in Genesis Midrash Rabbah 1-4 makes reference to this, that this can be rendered in the Hebrew for the sake of the beginning. So the world was created for the sake of the beginning. The beginning is Israel, Torah, and the Messiah. The world was created for the sake of Israel, for the sake of the Messiah, and for the sake of Torah. Therefore, they are all called the beginning. They are all one. You cannot separate Israel from the Torah, the Torah from Israel, Israel from the Messiah, the Messiah from Israel, the Messiah from Torah, and the Torah from the Messiah. They're all linked. They're all one. They're all associated with each other. So therefore, what has been done in the earth through what is called religion, the religions of Judaism and Christianity. Judaism, they have a connection with being Israel and Torah, but they've disconnected themselves from the Messiah. What has Christianity done? They recognize who the Messiah is, but they've disconnected him from Israel and the Torah. Such is the source of our problems. We're not seeing that all are one. So the restoration is the understanding and the recognition that all are one. This gets fulfilled in the Messianic era when there's a redeemed Israel who is following Torah and the Messiah is teaching Torah to all nations from Jerusalem. The Hebrew word first fruits, which is bikarim, is linked and associated with the Hebrew word for firstborn, which is bakor. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 22... It is written, And you shall say unto Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. This is the Strong's number 1060. It's the Hebrew word bakor, which means firstborn. And in context, it could mean firstborn of human beings or of animals. In Exodus chapter 23, verse 19, it says, The first of the first fruits of the land you shall bring unto the house of the Lord your God. The word first fruits here in Exodus 23, verse 19, is the Hebrew word bikor. The plural is bikorim, which means first fruits. So therefore, the Hebrew word for firstborn, bikor, and the Hebrew word for first fruits, bikor, Share in Hebrew the same base root letters, the B and the K and the R. Because they share the same root letters, they are linked and associated with each other. Bikarim, first fruits, is associated with firstborn or bikor. Adam was the world's firstborn. In Midrash Rabbah, Numbers chapter 4 and section 8, and making a commentary on Numbers chapter 3, verse 45, which says, Take the Levites. Our rabbis have said, Why did the Holy One, blessed be He, order the firstborn Israelites to be redeemed by means of the Levites? Because originally, before the tribe of Levi arose, the firstborn performed the sacrificial service or acted the role of the priest. There is proof that the firstborn offered the sacrifices before the tribe of Levi took office. Go back to the beginning of the creation of the world. Adam was the world's firstborn. When he offered his sacrifice, as it says, and it pleased the Lord better than a bullock that has horns and hoofs, Psalm 69, verse 31, he donned high priestly garments, as it says, and the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. The reference is Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. They were robes of honor which subsequent firstborn used. So Adam has the role of a priest. Adam was also given the birthright. Midrash Rabbah, Genesis 97, 6 says, and Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die. Genesis chapter 48, verse 21. Moreover, I have given to you one portion, which in Hebrew is Shechem, above your brethren. Genesis 48, 22. Rabbi Judah maintained the portion, which in Hebrew the word is Shechem, means the birthright 
in the raiment of Adam. This birthright was transferred ultimately from Adam to Shem. Continuing on in Midrash Rabbah Numbers, chapter 4, section 8, and making a commentary on the scripture, Numbers chapter 3, verse 45, take the Levites, the commentary is as follows. When Adam died, he transmitted them, that is the birthright, to Seth. Seth transmitted them to Methuselah. When Methuselah died, he transmitted them to Noah. Noah arose and offered a sacrifice, as it said, and he took of every clean beast and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. Noah died and transmitted them to Shem. There is proof that Shem offered sacrifices, since it says in Melchizedek, king of Salem, who in the literal sense is seen as being Shem, but it's a spiritual picture of Yeshua, the Messiah, because in the volume of the book it's written of him, brought forth bread and wine, and he was priest of God the Most High. Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. Now was it to him that the priesthood was given? What then is the meaning of the statement here? And he was priest, because he offered sacrifices like a priest. Shem died and handed the birthright to Abraham. The fact is that because he was a righteous man, the birthright was transferred to him and he offered sacrifices. And it says, And he offered up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Genesis chapter 32 verse 13. Abraham died and handed it on to Isaac. Isaac arose and handed it on to Jacob. Jacob, having taken the birthright, began to offer sacrifices, as it says, and God said unto Jacob, Arise, go to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God. Genesis chapter 35 and verse 1. Jacob, therefore, has the firstborn or the birthright status and position, and thus the blessing. In Midrash Rabbah, Numbers chapter 6, section 2, and making a commentary from the Torah in Numbers chapter 4, verse 22, where it says, Take the sum of. Hence it is written, He withdraws not his eyes from the righteous. Job chapter 36, verse 7. Which means that the Holy One, blessed be He, does not withhold from them some realization of His ideal. Thus we find that Jacob eagerly desired the birthright for a godly purpose, to wit, that he might be able to offer sacrifices or have the position of a priest, and so he acquired it from Esau for money. The Holy One, blessed be he, therefore gave him his approval and called him, My son, my firstborn, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, and conferred upon the firstborn the distinction of offering sacrifices before him. The firstborn, by being a priest, has priestly right. In Midrash Rabbah, Genesis chapter 63, section 13 says, Why did Jacob display such eagerness for the birthright? Because we learned that before the erection of the tabernacle, the sacrificial service was performed by firstborn. After the tabernacle was erected, the sacrificial service was performed by Levitical priests. Not only does the firstborn have priestly rights, but the firstborn also has kingship rights. Midrash Rabbah, Numbers chapter 6, section 2, goes on to say, But with kings upon the throne, Job 36, verse 7, signifies that the Holy One, blessed be He, allotted honor to the firstborn, and by them kingship, should fittingly be assumed, as it says, but the kingdom gave he to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. Second Chronicles chapter 21, verse 3. In the case of David, it likewise says, I also will appoint him firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Psalm 89, verse 27. This explains, but with kings upon the throne, he sets them forever. Job chapter 36 and verse 7. As a result, Adam was being a firstborn and having the birthright blessing. He was king over the creation of the God of Israel. 
How do we see that he had dominion or and he was to rule over the earth as a king? Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. It's kings that rule and reign and have dominion. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Then, in Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, it says, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you've made him a little lower than the, it says in the Hebrew, Elohim, and have crowned him with glory and honor. Man was crowned with glory and honor, just like a king. Therefore, Adam had the position and the status of being a king and a priest as well as being a firstborn of Yahweh's or the God of Israel's creation. The firstborn was given the birthright and he not only has the place of the firstborn but a king and a priest. Now, the firstborn king and priest status or position which originally was Adam's was ultimately passed down to Shem, ultimately to Abraham, and ultimately then to Jacob. Jacob possessed the position of king, priest, and firstborn. In Midrash Rabbah, Numbers chapter 6, section 2 says, And so Jacob says to Reuben, Reuben, you are my firstborn, the excellency of dignity. And the Hebrew word for dignity is seif and the excellency of power, the Hebrew word for power is oz, quoting from Genesis chapter 49, verse 3. But cf, which is translated as dignity in Genesis chapter 49, verse 3, means lifting up. And this is an allusion to the priesthood. For you read, and Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. Leviticus chapter 9 verse 22 while by oaths or by power or strength he alluded to kingship for it says he will give strength the Hebrew word is oaths unto his king 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 10 had Reuben not disgraced himself by his conduct with Bela he would have been worthy of assuming the priesthood and the kingship seeing that he was the firstborn Reuben was entitled the position of king, priest, and firstborn. Midrash Rabbah, Genesis 98, and section 4. And commenting on the verse, Genesis chapter 49, verse 3, Reuben, you are my firstborn, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. The birthright should have been yours. Priesthood should have been yours. Royalty should have been yours. Now that you have sinned, you do not have them. Reuben lost his status because of sexual sin. Genesis chapter 35 verse 22 says, And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. This is what Jacob or Israel is referring to when he's speaking to Reuben in Genesis chapter 49, verses 3 and 4, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel, because you went up to your father's bed, then defiled it, he went up to my couch. As a result of this, Jacob takes the king, priest, firstborn and birthright blessing status and functions and ultimately these things get split among the tribes of Israel in Midrash Rabbah Genesis chapter 98 section 4 says once again Reuben the birthright should have been yours the priesthood yours and royalty yours but now that you have sinned the birthright is given to Joseph the priesthood ultimately got given to Levi, and the kingship or royalty got given to Judah. The sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, are given the birthright blessing. 
In First Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but forasmuch as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright is given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. The sons of Joseph are Ephraim and Manasseh, as we can see that this blessing was given to them in Genesis chapter 48, verse 14 and 17. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the hand of Ephraim, because you give the blessing with the right hand, because the right hand symbolizes power and strength and to rule. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. He's saying, you should be giving this to the older and not the younger. In Genesis chapter 48, verse 19, And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, referring to Manasseh, and he also shall be great, but truly his younger brother shall be the greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations, which is Hebrew is Melo Hagoim, which means the fullness of the nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In you shall Israel bless, saying, God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. And this blessing is the blessing that is recited each and every traditional Sabbath service. This is the blessing that is given over our sons. Therefore, as a result, Ephraim is the firstborn of the God of Israel. We can see this in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 9. They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 18 through 20 it says regarding Ephraim I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus you have chastised me and I was chastised surely after that I was turned I repented and after that after I repented I was instructed what do you be instructed in Torah which is the straight way I smote upon my thigh I was ashamed Yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. What was he shamed about, that he didn't follow Torah? Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spoke against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, says the Lord. And the God of Israel redeems his people by bestowing mercy upon them. Judah is given the kingship in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. The scepter, which is used by a king, shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Shiloh is a term for the Messiah. And look what it says about Shiloh or the Messiah. And unto him, the Messiah, shall be the gathering of the people. What's the gathering of the people? That is gathering Jacob from being exiled in the nations of the world. It's the role of the Messiah to gather the exiles of the house of Jacob and to return them back to the land of Israel. There is a prophecy regarding it. Second Samuel chapter 3, verse 10, to translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David, the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan even to Beersheba. Therefore, Judah was given the kingship. The Levites became the priests. How did this happen? Well, in Midrash Rabbah Numbers, chapter 4, section 8, it says, Similarly, when Moses had sacrifices offered at Sinai, it was the firstborn who offered them, as it says. And he sent the young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings. 
Exodus chapter 24, verse 5. What is the meaning of the term young men? It refers to the youth among the firstborn who offered burnt offerings. From here you learn that no man offered sacrifices except the firstborn. Now, when Israel committed the unnameable act, that is the golden calf, they said, let the firstborn come and offer sacrifices to it, the golden calf. As it says, and they rose up early on the morrow, and they offered burnt offerings, and they brought peace offerings. Exodus chapter 32, verse 6. As a result of the sin of the golden calf, the firstborn do not then play the priestly service and the priestly role to offer sacrifices. The God of Israel gives this function to the Levites. Exodus chapter 32 verse 25 and 26 says, And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me, and all the sons of Levi gather themselves together unto him. The firstborn in all Israel lose their priesthood function because of sexual sin which is connected with the sin of the golden calf they the firstborn in fact would have been worthy of assuming the priestly office and the duties of the levites if they had not sinned in connection with the incident of the golden calf for originally the firstborn offered sacrifices as it says and he sent the young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings. Exodus chapter 24 verse 5. Who caused the firstborn to forfeit all this glory? The cause was their having exalted themselves and worshipped the golden calf. Thus we find that the firstborn Israelites fell from their greatness as a result of the incident of the golden calf. This comes from Midrash Rabbah Numbers chapter 6 section 2. As a result, the Levites become priests. In Midrash Rabbah, Numbers chapter 4, section 8 says, God said to them, I have given promotion to the firstborn, having made them great in the world, and they've renounced me and have risen and offered sacrifices before the calf. Behold, I shall dismiss the firstborn and enroll the sons of Levi. Therefore the Holy One, blessed be he, told Moses to number them, as it says, number the children of Levi. Numbers chapter 3 verse 15 continuing on in midrash rabad numbers chapter 4 section 8 said rabbi judah the levite who suggested to you that god dismissed the firstborn from the sacrificial duties and enrolled the sons of levi because it says take the levites in numbers chapter 3 verse 45 instead of whom take the levites instead of all the firstborn among the children of israel and the cattle of the levites instead of their cattle and the Levite shall be mine, I am the Lord. In Numbers chapter 8, verse 18, it says, And I have taken the Levites for all the firstborn of the children of Israel. First fruits, or bikarim, were brought to the Levites. In Numbers chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, it is written, And we cast the lots among the priests, the Levites, and the people, for the wood offering to bring it unto the house of our God after the houses of our fathers at times appointed year by year to burn upon the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the Torah and to bring the first fruits this is bikarim of our ground and the first fruits bikarim of all fruit of all trees year by year unto the house of the Lord. The firstborn were brought to the Levites. Nehemiah chapter 10 verse 36. Also the firstborn, that is Bekor, of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the Torah, and the firstlings of our herds and our flocks to bring to the house of our God under the priest that minister in the house of our God. In addition, the first of all things, which is the reshit, and tithes were brought to the Levites. Nehemiah chapter 10 verse 37 and that we should bring the first fruits which is reshit the first of all things of our dough and our offerings and the fruit of all manner of trees of wine and of oil under the priests to the chamber of the house of our God and the tithes of our ground under the Levites that the same Levites might have the tithes in all the cities of our tillage 
It is now mentioned in Midrash Rabbah, Exodus chapter 19, section 7, that the Messiah is a firstborn. Rabbi Nathan said, The Holy One, blessed be he, told Moses, Just as I have made Jacob a firstborn, for it says, Israel is my son, my firstborn, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, so will I make King Messiah a firstborn, as it says, I also will appoint him firstborn, Psalm chapter 89, verse 28. If you look at Psalm 89, verse 28, this is literally speaking about David. So the interpretation, when it's speaking about David, it's speaking about King Messiah. So here in the Midrash Rabbah, it mentions that King Messiah will be a firstborn, and the association in Psalm 89:28 is he's also going to be a king. Messiah is the firstborn son of Miriam. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Yeshua. Yeshua, the Messiah, is referred to as being a firstborn in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 who is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature next verse Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created by him and for him now Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 and he is the head, the Rosh. He's the head of the body, the congregation, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Yeshua is the firstborn of the creation. The body of Messiah is also referred to as being a congregation of firstborn. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 and 23, it is written, But you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and congregation of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Yeshua is not only the firstborn of creation, but he is also our high priest. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Mashiach Yeshua. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Yeshua, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Not only is Yeshua the high priest, but the body of Messiah is called a holy priesthood. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, and then 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, in addition to Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, says, You also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Yeshua HaMashiach. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In Revelation chapter 5 verse 10 it is written, He has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we will reign on the earth. Yeshua is not only the firstborn of creation, he is not only the high priest, but he is also the king of Israel. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. It shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, that is Yeshua the Messiah, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In John chapter 1, verse 49, it is written, Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the king of Israel. John chapter 12, verse 12 and verse 13 says the following, On the next day, 
Much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Yeshua was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that comes in the name of the Lord. The body of Messiah are referred to as being kings in Yeshua. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 12 says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us also. Who reigns? Kings. Revelation chapter 1 verse 6. He has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Revelation chapter 5 verse 10. He has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we will reign on the earth. Yeshua is the firstborn of the creation. He's the high priest. He's the king of Israel. Being in Messiah, the body of Messiah is a congregation of firstborn. The body of Messiah is a congregation of kings and priests. So that which Adam originally had and the status that he had, the body of Messiah has in the Messiah. First fruits is a harvest festival. Exodus chapter 23, verse 14 and verse 16. Three times you shall keep a feast unto me in the year. In the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field, in the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when you have gathered in your labors out of the field. A sheaf in the Bible represents a person or people. We can see this in Genesis chapter 37, verse 5 and verse 7. Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obedience to my sheaf. So here in the dream, a sheaf represents a person or people. The harvest is the exiles of Israel returning and gathering them and proclaiming good news to them. The good news of Messiah and they need to follow Torah. Psalm 126 verse 1 and verse 6 says, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. He that goes forth and weeps bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with him bringing his sheaves with him the exiles of Israel who are returning are referred to as being sheaves that are returning they are sheaves of the harvest the harvest are those who accept Yeshua as the Messiah Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 20 the harvest is past the summer is ended And we are not redeemed, saved, or delivered. Hosea chapter 6 verse 11. Also, O Judah, he has set a harvest for you when I have returned the captivity of my people. When I return the captivity of my people, a harvest is set for Judah. In other words, Judah is a part of that harvest. Joel chapter 3 verse 13. Put you in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. What's the harvest referred to here? Come, get you down, for the press is full. The vats overflow, for the wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The harvest is ripe. Multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now in Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 29, it is written. He said, So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knows not how. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, the first fruit, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn of the ear. So the harvest is first the first fruit, and then the fullness of the harvest. But when the fruit is brought forth, that's the fullness of it, immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Now let's look at themes of Aviv or Nisan 17. The themes of Aviv or Nisan 17, which is three days following Passover, which is Nisan 14. The theme of Nisan or Aviv 17 is resurrection, deliverance, and new beginnings. Let's see how this is so. Noah's Ark rested on Mount Ararat's 
on Aviv or Nisan 17. In order to understand this, we need to realize that from Genesis chapter 1 to Exodus chapter 12, when dates are mentioned in the Bible, we use what is referred to as the civil calendar, where Aviv or Nisan is the seventh month and Tishrei is the first month. It is stated in Scripture that Aviv or Nisan is the first month and became the first month as it was declared and decreed by the God of Israel in Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. So Genesis chapter 8, verse 4 is prior to the God of Israel saying, Aviv or Nisan is going to be your first month. And it says in Genesis chapter 8, verse 4, And the ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. So this would be Aviv or Nisan 17. Israel crosses the Red Sea on Aviv or Nisan 17. Exodus chapter 5 verse 3 says, They said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God. So the request was to go three days. Well, they, they killed the Passover lamb on the 14th, and if three days following that is the 17th. Exodus chapter 14, verse 29. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and also on their left. Israel eats the fruit of the promised land on Aviv or Nisan 17 when they go in to the promised land. This was the first day when they were allowed to eat the fruit of the promised land. Joshua chapter 5 verses 10 through 12, it is written, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at evening in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, which is going to be the 15th, which begins on leavened bread. So they ate unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. That would be the 16th. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. So the manna ceases on the 16th, and following it is said that they eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year, which was then Aviv or Nisan 17 when it was then possible to do so. Yeshua is resurrected on Aviv or Nisan 17. He's crucified on Passover on Aviv or Nisan 14. He's in the grave three days and three nights, which gives us to Aviv or Nisan 17. Matthew chapter 12 verse 40 says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew chapter 16 verse 21 says, From that time forth began Yeshua to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Yeshua is the first fruits of the resurrection of life. He's called the first fruits. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 23, it is written, But now is Messiah risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, that's Adam, by man, that is Yeshua, came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Messiah shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, this is the order of resurrection, this is the order of harvest, which the harvest includes a first fruit harvest. Messiah the first fruits, afterward they that are Messiahs at his coming, which is the greater harvest. Yeshua is the firstborn of many brethren, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren or the firstborn among many firstborn because the body of Messiah is a congregation of firstborn. The believers in Yeshua as the Messiah are first fruits of the creation of the God of Israel. James chapter 1 verse 18 says, of his own will begat he us 
with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is going to conclude our teaching on the festival of first fruits. And from this festival, we have learned that in Leviticus chapter 23, it was commanded that an omer, which is interpreted by the rabbis to be of barley, was initially offered, and that this gets associated with a first fruit festival. And looking at first fruits, which the Hebrew word is bikarim, that word in Hebrew is associated or linked with reshit, which is the first or the beginning of all things, and it is also associated or linked with bakor, which is the Hebrew word for the firstborn. First fruits or bikarim is associated with reshit or the beginning. The Torah is called the beginning, and it existed before the creation of the heavens and the earth. In Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 and 23, Israel is called the Reshit, or the beginning, in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 3. And the Messiah is called the Reshit, or the beginning, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. Therefore, the Torah, Israel, and the Messiah are all one and cannot be separated from each other. Adam was created, and he had the place and the position of being a firstborn who had the position of a king and a priest, and also he had the birthright blessing. And ultimately, that which he had gets passed down to Shem, to Abraham, and then unto Jacob. Jacob then takes these things, and Ephraim and Manasseh is given the birthright blessing, or the blessing of the firstborn. The kingship is given to Judah, and the priesthood, as a result of the sin of the golden calf, the Levites receive the priesthood. So on the linear level, this king, priest, firstborn, which is what you need to rule and reign on the earth. You need all of these things together to rule and reign on the earth. On the linear level, they are split between Judah being the king and Ephraim being the firstborn or the birthright blessing and the Levites became the priests. So on the linear physical level, in order for there to be a ruling and reigning on the earth, there has to be a coming together of Ephraim and Judah, which is the coming together of the king represented by Judah, and the blessing of the fruitfulness of the earth represented by Ephraim, who has the firstborn or the birthright blessing, along with the Levites, who are the priests. Together, when we bring all of these together, united as one, the kingship, the birthright, or the firstborn blessing, and the priestly function, you are able to rule and reign in the earth. Spiritually, in Messiah, the body of Messiah already has this place of being a firstborn, of being a king and a priest. And in Messiah spiritually can rule and reign in the earth and have greater place and position over the death that comes from the physical world. By being in Messiah, we are overcomers of the death that reigns in the physical world. So Yeshua is the first fruits, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20 and verse 23. Yeshua is not only the first fruits, he's the high priest, he is the king of Israel, he is the firstborn. That is why he is able to rule and reign and be the head of the body that is named by him, the body of the Messiah. 
I pray that this teaching on first fruits has been beneficial, insightful, and helpful to you in your studies as we're learning all about the biblical festivals. In closing, we need to remember these words that comes from 1 John in chapter 2, verse 6. He that says he abides in him, he who says that he is of Messiah, is, is a follower and a believer of the Messiah, ought himself so to walk, which means to live our lives, as he walked. How did Messiah live his life? He didn't sin. He followed Torah. So therefore, those of us who are followers of the Messiah should walk as he walked, which means we should express our faith in Yeshua as the Messiah by keeping his commandments, which means we don't live a sinful life, and we thus follow Torah. Shalom in Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. Oh, uh-huh.